we still have people coming in. So we wanted to start just a couple minutes uh, later than planned. There was a little bit of a, a mess up with the uh, Zoom link, but I think we'll jump in now. So welcome. Um, I am Eric Gordon and welcome to tonight's performance of Shelter in Place. We're very excited to show you a little peek at what the freshman class at Credo High School has been doing for the last few months. In January, the entire freshman class uh, set out to document some of the less heard voices of people living through the coronavirus. Following in the tradition of documentary theater, we conducted interviews. The students went out, many in Zoom, some in person, gathering and recording stories. It was a slow and deliberate process and throughout the students transcribed those interviews, edited them, and eventually turned them into verbatim monologues, word for word, what the person said to them. The characters, if we can call them that, you'll meet in tonight's performance, they're real people. They're next door neighbors, they're emergency room technicians, they're local government officials and activists and family members. Their stories are powerful. Some painfully represents the tragedy that has been this last year, while others celebrate community and really focus on the strength of human spirit and our togetherness. Our motivation for the project was layered. As teachers, and I'm gonna introduce um, my co-teacher in a minute, uh, we wanted to acknowledge this is such an important moment in history. And we wanted the students to be able to pull that bird's eye view and, really understand that, that they're living through something that the next generation will be studying in history class. They're a part of it. We wanted them to explore the complexity of the impact of this pandemic, the ripple effects of uh, how deep and wide this actually impacted everyone on the planet. And we wanted to support students to take action by documenting the real stories of actual people Finally, uh, we wanted to create a space as teachers to process what was happening around us, the challenges, the opportunities, and the tragedies, the resilience we saw in our communities. We wanted a place to explore that while taking action, while being out gathering stories, bearing witness, listening to other people. You're gonna see about a dozen monologues in tonight's presentation. And I should say only a dozen monologues. Um, I wanna remind you that this is just a small selection of the work. Across the four freshman classes, there were a total of 103 monologues, um, which we watched and we celebrated in class together. This performance is a tribute to the entire freshman's class work. All 100 and something of them. Uh, I, I really wanna give a big shout out to Ms. Bridget Fitzgibbon. Uh, Ms. Fitzgibbon is my co-teacher in this project, my uh, counterpart, uh, we're each other's confidants. We've planned curriculum together. We've brought the classes together and, and we've taught, co-taught these classes for the last few months. And this truly was a collaborative work. And, and I can very honestly say without her, we wouldn't be here. And while she can't be here with us, um, we're giving her uh, we're giving her our gratitude across the uh, Zoom waves. Um, I'd also like to thank Michael Noakes, who's behind the scenes, helping with the technology. Um, this idea of Zoom theater—it's uh, a new concept to me—and he's helping us iron out the kinks. And I guess the the last thanks is to the Credo community and to. Uh, Andrea Ackman Collins, the principal of Credo High School. You know, I'm new at the school. This is my first year. But Credo is, it's clearly a, a special school and a rare school and a school that values creativity, thinking outside of the box, a school that can make space for work like this. But before I introduce the first monologue, um, I'd like us all just to pause and invite you to take a moment of silence for all the people that have struggled and suffered during this pandemic. 
you know, there might be someone specific that you'd like to hold in your mind. Or maybe, maybe you just want to send some healing thoughts out to the world. But let's just take a moment of silence before we begin. Thank you. And now we turn to our fabulous cast. First up is gonna be Orion uh, Pudif, who's gonna be performing Anne Hamilton. The monologue is called The Wisdom of Others. And let's see if we can bring him live. There he is. Hi, Orion. Um, Orion describes Anne as an adventurous, kind, and a selfless person. During the pandemic, she supported the homeless population of Sonoma County trying to lower the spread of the virus, provide people with food and safe places to find shelter. Orion, take us away. On a personal level, I thought the pandemic was super hard because I'm a big planner and it made me like that whole piece of, oh, we can't do anything. I want my family to go camping. Oh, we. I want Trav to work with me on this. And all of a sudden I wasn't allowed to do any of that. And it made me have to really sit with myself. And it made me realize that I use planning stuff as a way to stay feeling okay about myself because I can kind of disconnect and be busy. And because of COVID, I had like three months where I had to really just not plan anything, not go for walks in the park, not for, um, and it made me have a, a kind of emotional crisis of isolation. And then as I got more used to just sitting with being uncomfortable, I actually found that I'm more able to be quiet now. I really learned a piece about the wisdom of others, like listening to what their truths are and going, well, where's the wisdom in that? And I think the outcome of this whole COVID thing is I see way less people, but the people I see, it matters more. And it's also given me a piece of myself to be calmer and to also realize now, like when I start planning a lot of stuff, I know that something's probably sad for me and that I need to just sit with it. So I think there's been a really beautiful side to COVID too, of calming the hell down and just having more time to be present. Thank you, Orion. I'm glad that we could start on a really positive note. Start with uh, a story that represents growth and, and hope. Next up is uh, Evelyn Goodwin. She's gonna be performing Jeffrey Goodwin in a monologue that's titled, A Stormy Delivery. So before the pandemic, Jeffrey Goodwin worked as a DJ and an entertainer throughout Sonoma County. When COVID struck, all of the venues closed and virtually all live entertainment was canceled. With a need to adapt to the changes, he took a job delivering groceries. And this is his story. Um, I walked into a Target and it was storming outside, like storming. Like there was thunder and lightning and we don't get a lot of lightning in this area. I walked into the store and I was walking down the aisle and all of a sudden the lights went out while I was shopping for somebody else's order. Like the lights went out. And then three seconds later, the lights came back on. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess that was just a power search. And then I'd walk about another hundred feet and the lights would go out again. 
and they'd be out for like 30 seconds and then they'd come back on. So I was literally, and, and it was happening off and on like that through the entire process. So much that the staff didn't even know what to do. They didn't know if they should empty the store, they should close the store, like they didn't know. So I just continued to shop. So I was literally shopping with my flashlight to get people's items. And then I get to the front and then they check me out and then I leave and you could just see the lights going off and on in the entire parking lot. Like it goes black and then it flashes green and then it goes back and then it flashes green. It was the weirdest thing. And then delivering it in the pouring down rain, the rain is just pouring and the wind's blowing and the rain is going sideways because the wind is blowing so hard and I'm delivering these groceries and I'm getting soaked. And I'm just thinking, putting them down on this doorstep, and I'm just thinking, these groceries are gonna be completely wet by the time this person gets them inside their door. If they even wanna open their door because the rain is coming in sideways. It was nuts. Thank you, Evelyn, very much. Next up is Maria Kaufman Ott. She's going to be performing Chris Perkowska in a mon monologue titled Pandemic Move. When the pandemic struck, Chris Perkowska was living with his small daughter, with his daughter in a small, unpermitted housing unit on his landlord's property. When the property was reported to the county, he was evicted and he found himself looking for a new home in the middle of a chaotic housing market. Maria. When I was living in California, some neighbor decided that um, they were gonna tell the county permit office that my landlord didn't have a permit for all our properties. And so I got an eviction notice and I, like, I had to move. So I started looking for housing in the area and all the housing went sky high because of all the people from San Francisco moving up, raising up the prices. And so um, I started looking for, yeah, I had looked at this property in Taos and I started like trying to buy it and they weren't, we couldn't agree on a, prop, a price. And then I lost $100,000 of my investment money in a fraud scheme. My whole like 700 of us investors found out we were being cheated. And so then I was like, God, I can't move. So I wanted to squat, which means like they would have had to like drag me out, you know, by like force or law or whatever. And it was in August by this time and there was this super crazy windy night and there was a lot of lightning that was striking all over and the next day it was like noon and I looked out the window and there were literally squirrels falling in front of the window and and then leaves and then all of a sudden I realized the tree a tree is falling on the house and I was like, oh my God, let's get out of here. And so this other tree kind of broke its fall. So it came to rest just on our, our roof. But when I looked, came outside and saw this massive oak tree sitting on our roof, I was like, I need to move. And so then a month later, the, this house that I had seen in March came back on the market really reduced in price. And so long story short, six months later, I'm um, living in a house. Thank you, Maria. Fantastic job. One of the things that really stood out as we created this project was how in these stories, there was a natural arc that was present. You know, the students discovered it as they were editing, carving things down, but a story arc emerged and very often a very dramatic one. You know, squirrels falling out of trees, um, the storm all converging at the same time. In this next story by Ty Shoning, 
who's performing Riley Ellis Rice in a monologue called Repetition, there's a kind of irony that sounds almost made up. Riley's a fourth year veterinary student at UC Davis's School of Veterinary Medicine. When she first learned about COVID-19, she was in a vi virology class of all places. Ty, take us away. Um, so it was actually kind of interesting because we were in our immunology and infectious disease block. So we were talking about viruses and learning from this woman who has studied viruses all of her life. And she started bringing up something called COVID. And at first we didn't pay much attention to it, but she started saying, guys, this is serious. Um, but we still brushed it off and um, we should have listened to her because fast forward two weeks and it's everywhere. So then we switched to population health. So the order in which we learned it in was quite interesting and it paralleled a lot of things. So back in March last year, um, well, I was first excited because it meant I had a break from school uh, for a couple of weeks, but then I got really mad because I realized it wasn't gonna end. And I got mad because I'm paying thousands of dollars to go to this school and now it's going to be all online. And I guess the biggest hardship out of that was having to be in class all day, eating in the same house, working out in the same house and just doing everything in the same house. Um, so specifically going into labs, I'd definitely say we were shorthanded on our experience right in the summer of 2020. So when we started our first surgery, it was a little scary because you're usually able to go into labs and work with the animals before you're going to basically cut them open. Um, so it was a very awful thing, but it was also very interesting to learn about. Thank you, Ty. Fantastic. Moving forward, next up we have Zephan McShane, who's performing uh, Sean and Whaley in a monologue titled simply Fear. Sean and Whaley works as a nurse in Napa County. Her story explains some of the ways that the virus impacted her place of work and the lives of her patients. And Zephan, take us away. So the early virus period for me, uh, took place in a hospital setting, which was somewhat chaotic, I think, in the beginning. I think everyone was a little unsure what exactly we need to do as providers um, to, to be safe and to keep people safe. There was so much uh, new information that hadn't been fully, I think, understood or put in uh, guidelines as far as how to treat patients with appropriate uh, PPE, which is, you know, protective equipment. And so uh, it was somewhat chaotic because it changed the way I delivered my practice to patients. It, it felt very disconnected. And uh, I, I think everyone was living in a lot of fear. And so, um, uh, you know, looking forward, I, you know, ear out, uh, I am happy to say that, um, Thank goodness I, we live where we do, because uh, I, I do believe that um, time was on our side. And so when we saw numbers rise, we were prepared, I think, to deal with it in a way that had supportive uh, structure. And, uh, you know, to really nail in, I think, what we were doing as far as delivering safe care to patients. And uh, now, I, you know, I think there's, there's hope. Uh, the vaccines have really helped kind of calm the nerve of the community and uh, people who would ordinarily not come back to the hospital uh, you know, because they were so living in fear of catching COVID. Um, you know, in the beginning, we had people who were unfortunately not getting the care they needed because they were so living in that fear. And so when they would eventually show up to the hospital, they were very, very, very sick. And so now I think we're, we're finding people who are coming back and more normal sort of flow 
um, in, in a sense that they're not waiting till they're critically ill to be seen. And um, it's that fear has kind of been uh, not not downplayed, but it's just it's there's a lot more new information and some safety nets in place that are working. Stefan, thank you. Uh, one of the things that really stands out in this project with our 103 monologists was the range of voices that there were so many different perspectives that were captured and some of them very unexpected, unusual. Um, we had uh, a woman who owns a dance studio who had to turn it's a very physical activity online. We had the first person to receive the vaccine in Sonoma County. Um, we had a woman who knit gifts for strangers. Um, so this, this huge range of perspectives. And one of the things that we found as we celebrated the stories in class was as these perspectives layer, it really complicates the story of this pandemic. It's not one single thing, but it's so many things as we've all experienced. This is a way that really pointed it out. Our next monologue is by, it's a video. Um, we're gonna bring in a couple of videos because we really wanna celebrate uh, some of the students who aren't performing live and just remind you that there are actually so many students. This is an entire grade wide project and really celebrate the whole grade tonight. Uh, next up is Isaiah Morbido who will be performing Amber Morbido. The monologue is called The Ripple Effects. Amber's a professor and a consultant and she tells the story of how the isolation of the pandemic impacted her students. The story highlights a ripple effect of the pandemic and reminds us that tragedy struck so many people in so many different ways. And here is Isaiah. As a teacher, I definitely can say I've never worked as hard as I'm working now. Um, I've been in education, in higher education, teaching at the college level since 2004. And I've taught at a handful of institutions, probably about five in two, in two different states. And I will say, I've never worked as hard as I'm working now. Um, when I think about what has changed, it's more of the emotional load that it's taken on me. Students are definitely much more fragile. Um, they're much more anxious. They're um, very worried. Um, I have very high expectations of my students. I let them know emotionally my expectations and I tend to hold the bar very high. Um, and being all virtual, I felt the need to be very flexible. Um, I've taught in Sonoma County since 2014 and every fall I kind of have to, well, I've been since the big fires in 2017 I've learned that the fall requires me to be very flexible. So I kind of went into that default space emotionally for myself. And I had to meet this moment with um, lots of compassion. I had to hold lots of emotions of my students. Um, I had a student commit suicide. And that was just awful. Um, he was switching career paths. He was a single father of a 14 year old daughter. Um, he sat in the front. He was a shining light, bright light. He would stay before and after class and just talk to me about different concepts. And so when the pandemic happened um, and we switched over to virtual, I saw him once. I checked in with the students, asked them how they were doing, asked him how he was doing. Um, he said he wasn't doing well. I validated his and all of the students' feelings that it was a very challenging time and that we would figure it out. And the next day um, is when I found out that he had um, had an accidental overdose. And so what I didn't know about him was that he was new in his recovery and he was an addict who was fighting for his recovery and the stress and uncertainty of, and fear of the pandemic, he was also dealing with it and, didn't, uh, and did not have the skills to cope with his new sobriety and use drugs again. That's the thing, especially as a psychologist, when we think of mental health, 
there's so many ripple effects that the pandemic has caused that we'll never know the long-term impacts. I really pride myself on the influence that I have on my students. Um, so there was a piece of like, could I have done more? Um, I then experienced those emotions all over again, 40 times. I called every single student of mine and told them what had happened. Thank you, Isaiah. When we were reading monologues in class, we had to stop when that monologue was first shared because it was so painful uh, and really just give space to the sadness of this piece, to the tragedy of this piece. And there was a, a, a live element to this work where both Ms. Fitzgibbon and myself we planned the curriculum very elaborately. We didn't know what was coming next. And sometimes things totally surprised us, took our breath away even like that monologue. Uh, the next monologue that you're gonna hear is by Ella Martin. She's performing Jonathan Van Nuys and the monologue is titled From a Harlem Stoop. This monologue gives a little bit of, it's, it's a monologue that starts at a different time than most of them. And it's kind of, it sets the stage in some ways. Um, Jonathan Van Nuys is an immunocompromised nurse practitioner in San Francisco. He was in New York for his birthday when the news of the 2016 election and Trump's victory first hit. Ella's monologue helps provide backstory and context for the political nature that the pandemic ultimately became. And Ella, take us away, please. Yeah, the one in um, in 2016 was very memorable, of course. I was with you and um, it was my birthday and our whole family was in New York. And it was a great day. I was really happy. I think everybody was really happy. We went all around town. I think we all thought there was gonna be a different outcome, went out to a nice dinner. And it wasn't until later that night that the return started to roll in and things started to look bad. And I was out at a bar with uh, your mom, my sister, and um, you would hear a pin drop. It was obvious what was happening. I think everybody was in shock. So um, eventually we went back to my brother's apartment in Harlem and um, I just thought, I can't go in, man. I just, I can't go in. I don't know what to do. So I walked around Harlem for a while and sat in someone's stoop for like hours and just thought, I don't know what to do don't know what to do, ma'am, but what can you do? You can't, as an individual person, do anything in that moment. So um, eventually went to bed and thought it was all going to be a bad dream, and it wasn't. And then in the morning, especially, I don't know if you knew, but I know Grace and Sam woke up and we're all like, oh, did Hillary win? And it's like, no. And I think somebody said, um, but I thought Trump was a bad man, and... <laughs> It's like, how do you explain that? Thank you, Ella. Our next monologue is another video that we're gonna bring in. Um, we heard a lot uh, for most of us on the news and, and in the media about how bad things could get at senior centers and for senior senior citizens in vulnerable populations. Um, some of us had family in, that was living in senior centers and many of us had elderly family who was more vulnerable. Iris O'Connor's performance of Pat O'Connor, her grandmother, the monologue is called I Am Lonely. Pat's a retired teacher in her late seventies and the interview took place over Zoom and she spoke to us from the senior center where she lives. And here is Iris on video. So I'd like to say I'm a, I'm a pretty positive person. I'm an optimistic person. And, you know, so I tried, I tried not to think about the danger aspects for people of my age. And though I am 76, I don't think of myself as, el I don't think of myself as elderly. 
but at the same time, I took a lot of precautions um, for my safety because it was scary knowing that that I was more vulnerable to getting sick, you know. So yeah, I mean, I didn't go I didn't go out much during the day. I would go on walks in the morning for exercise, and I would hardly see anybody. I'd go shopping during senior hour, and you know, I it was more. It was more a matter of feeling lonely, um, just not having, you know, human contact, um, because I truly, I truly miss my, the senior center, my friends from art class, and yeah, I actually had, um, I had four of my friends die from, from COVID, and that was that was really really hard for me it was so hard to lose them such wonderful folks and wonderful <sighs> yeah so that really brought it to reality for me you know they were a little bit older they were in their 80s um and it just kind of reminded my it helped it you know, it made me feel like I needed to call someone every day. It reminded me to call call the people I love to check in on them and you know maybe I'd think hmm who who needs a call um, and I'd reach out and see how they're doing um, because I have firsthand experience of what it's like to lose to lose someone you know and yeah I would just try and reach out to everyone that I love as much as I could. And thank you, Iris, for that video. Next up is Kendall Lannard. She's going to be performing Kenyatta Reynolds. Her monologue is titled From Heroes to Villains. And she's bringing in some of the, the distance learning, the teacher perspective um, that was so present for for all of us who live in schools, teachers and students and what this meant to us. Kenyatta Reynolds is an educator and a mother of three. Her story is told from the perspective of a teacher reflecting on what it was like to enter into remote learning and broadcast into the homes of her students. Kendall, take us away, please. I feel like at the beginning of the pandemic, the teachers were all heroes, right? Like they were just like, Oh, they, they all went online and everyone just kind of like made it happen and we finished out the year. Um, and that was a couple, I guess, three months, right, of school. And then everyone thought we'd return to like normal life and it would be fine. And then somehow now, like a year later, the same teachers that were heroes are now the villains, right? So it was interesting to see the shift in people's thoughts, or I guess, expectations from the teachers during this whole thing. Like I just posted today about how we need to be kind and say nice things to teachers because I think they're exhausted too. And I think people forget that teachers are human and this is their job, right? And so even though teachers are supposed to be educating kids, well, they are. Teachers are not not teaching. They're just, they're just having to teach in a different way. So I think it's upsetting when people say that they aren't working because like they are. Um, so that was interesting to see how it shifted from the beginning of the pandemic to now the end. I mean, like I teach, right? And my kids have each of them um, have three different teachers and they all handle it a little bit differently. Um, but also just like remind yourself that they also have a family and things to do and are also struggling with the pandemic on their own personal level, but they obviously can't bring that to work because they have to like be there for the kids. Um, like with the whole Black Lives Matter situation, that was also interesting, right? Because you have, it's like, like usually when the kids go to school, the kids go to school and like you teach them whatever and then they go home, right? but now you're in people's houses. So I found myself more aware of what I was saying or not saying some things that I might normally say. 
or just being overly cautious because you just feel like you're always being listened to and things can be taken out of context. I feel like people are always looking for things now, right? I don't know, maybe. I just feel like more so now, people are always looking for things to be mad about or to like get you on. Or maybe that's just my experience as a black teacher. Thank you, Kendall. We have another teacher coming up. Um, this one is performed by Coco McKenzie and she's performing Kelly McNeil, who's a credo teacher. And the monologue is called Holding Back. Kelly McNeil is a teacher at Credo High School. She leads farming, herbalism, and personal sustainability classes in the Waldorf tradition. Coco, take us away, please. Well, because I teach so many different things, um, each one has their challenge, but it's pretty much the same. So um, in ninth grade, normally, you guys would be in class and we would be in the garden. And so it's very different trying to teach online. Um, I've always really tried to maintain the class by really um, watching the students and seeing where their interests are. And some kids, you know, wanna get in and take a machete and knock down plants and other kids want to chit chat and pick calendula flowers. And, you know, they all have their interests. Some are into weeding, some are into digging. So I try to pair kids up and put them in groups and really, you know, see where their interests are. And so now that it's online, it's like a one shot deal. I give everyone the same thing. And, um, and so, you know, these are plants and we're not even doing plants. Um, and then there's the fact that you're at home and, um, you know, I might start off the class by saying, so, you know, your parents maybe drove you to school this morning you had an interaction like, what's going on? Like how, what's it like? And kids can get a lot more real in that situation. And that's, you know, you, kids are holding back a lot more when they're at home. Um, you know, that's just, it's, it's like, you know, who knows? Plus, as teachers, we don't know who's sitting right over there listening to the whole conversation. I guess it's that way in every class, but in personal, um, it really takes away from the personal. Thank you, Coco. This is terrific. So I showed my mother um, a bunch of these performances, um, which, you know, it just struck me, I, it probably says something about uh, a project when the teacher shows, shows his mother um, the outcomes. Um, and, and I think that that's probably pretty true that both Ms. Fitzgibbon and myself, we were so proud of the students and are so proud of the students and that the energy level, um, which can be very low on Zoom, um, really came up, there was high energy in the classroom and people were really you know, embodying these. Um, but that was to say her first comment was, it's like they became the characters. It's like they became the people they interviewed. Um, and I agree, we saw these transformations. Next up is Josephine Manon Ventilla Abelsnes. She's performing Vegger uh, Abelsnes in a monologue called, I used to have the house to myself. Vigor is a, uh, a photographer from Norway, living in Petaluma. His is the last monologue of the evening. And I think it's appropriately the last because it tells a really great story about gratitude and community resilience. Josephine, take us away. I used to have the house to myself every day when everyone would go to their schools. So me and, me and our cat now have company 24 seven, which we didn't 
never had before. So that's been a big change. It's actually really nice to have everybody at home and at school at the same time. It's, it's very nice, cozy. I tried to go to the store buy a bunch of stuff like toilet paper, <laughs> um, but everywhere was already sold out and, and it was kind of big panic everywhere. So we uh, did what we could. We went to a few stores and then we just decided to take the whole COVID situation very seriously. And then we decided to start ordering the things that we needed from various stores online and to have it delivered. And that's worked out pretty well so far for the most part, except for when we got really low on toilet paper for a while, but we managed to get through that. I even ordered some paper, toilet paper from China. <laughs> it, it finally arrived like three months later, but <laughs> we got it. That was fun. Ev at, at 8 p.m., everybody in the neighborhood and everybody in Petaluma, um, maybe not everywhere, but it seemed like they did it everywhere. At 8 p.m., we would all go out on the street and we would howl uh, in a honor of all the uh, frontline workers and people taking care of those with COVID. And we would all go out and uh, howl and uh, bark. And Seb, Sebastian, my son, brought his trombone out and out, and I brought my didgeridoo out. And we just had a bunch of fun, just making lots of noise every night at 8 p.m. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, so in a second, I'm going to call the cast back out. Um, but I just want to take a minute to, to um, Thank you all for coming and supporting. And as the cast comes out, since we can't see everybody in the webinar, what I ask is everybody like this chat up um, with some shout outs to this cast. And can we bring the cast in, Mr. Lokes? For a little bit of uh, a little bit of howling, maybe. <laughs> And Ella, can you put your camera on, please? And let's give some big giant applause for everybody that we see here. Give some shout outs in the chat, if you would, so they can see him coming. I love it. Applause, applause, applause. We can't hear it but we can see it and it's loud. And I'd like to give really, really big applause to the entire ninth grade, the whole ninth grade who just did such exceptional work in this project and uh, people whose monologues weren't featured tonight, who didn't perform live. Uh, we still celebrated you in class and wonderful work. Um, we're gonna take a couple of minutes to take some questions thinking that some of you might have questions for specific actors or open questions about the process. If you have questions about anything that we did in this sequence, what was challenging to, to these writer actors uh, or anything about the curriculum, please feel free to ask it. And again, you can ask a general question to anyone on the panel or a, uh, a very specific question. And brilliant, brilliant may not be a question, but it's greatly appreciated. Did you hear that, you guys? If any uh, attendees raise their hand, I can, there you go. Perfect. How much editing did it take? Can someone speak to the editing process? What was it like to take that interview and create it into a monologue. Can somebody walk through? There were definitely through? some bloopers for sure. Yeah. Some bloopers? Yeah, Orion. Uh, like when you say editing, do you mean like um, taking it from the video and then like writing it out into a uh, script form? Yeah, how it went from your interview to transcription Editing um, that down to first draft yeah. monologue and then final monologue. Yeah. I think it was um, 
personally for me, it was really interesting because I, I like had my whole interview and then at the end, my interviewee like had this one point, like I was like, I was like, okay, thank you. Like, this was like an awesome interview. Like, thanks for the your, like, time. And they were like, wait, I want to say something. And I was like, oh, well, okay. And then like, they said something and that was like my favorite part of the interview. And so um, I didn't work too much on editing. Uh, there was a couple things and um, really getting it to flow was difficult. But um, overall, I thought uh, like just a, a thing I took away from this was like uh, just letting your, your interviewee talk and like not asking that many questions really gave the best results for like a seamless uh, monologue that you don't even have to edit all that much. Fantastic. Yeah, we talked in class about how you can look at the transcript of one of these monologues and get a sense of how much, you know, just holding it out and seeing how much the interviewer talked and how much the subject talked. And most of these interviewers, the inter most of these interviews, the interviewer talked very little. They just encouraged and prompted for details with the story. Um, let's see, we have a couple more coming in. Um, uh, Eric? Yes. So if, if um, we have a question from Marcina, and if you guys, the attendees, if you raise your hand, I can, um, I can allow you to talk to and have a conversation. Um, so if you want to try that, you can do that as well. And Marcina, is it, it it's in the chat? Uh, no, she's uh, an attendee, it's Ms. Peterson. Oh, can you, uh, so can you speak yeah, the question she, then? I think so. Marcina, can you, can you talk? Yes, are, am, I, am I there? Yes, you're live. Okay, <laughs> um, wonderful. Well, um, so I'm Marcina Peterson. I'm an admin here at Credo. And I am just so touched by your stories and absolutely remarkable um, for such young people, you know, coming into Credo and creating this beautiful event. And I, I was just curious about, you know, how did you decide the person you wanted to interview, how did you decide that that was the person who really grabbed you? And then, you know, how did you decide to embody them? Because, you know, everybody's um, monologue tonight just felt so real and true. And um, it was just really gorgeous. So if, if anyone would like to speak to that, I'm sure we would, we'd love to hear more about you know, your process and, and finding, you know, that particular person and then, um, you know, deciding to make this, make this your project. Yeah, Josephine. Um, well, something that I did and I think a bunch of other people may have done is they like thought about what they wanted the outcome of the interview to be, which were like to choose who they wanted to interview. So like if you wanted to talk to someone to learn more about like this COVID situation, like in hospitals, then you'd more likely talk to like a nurse or someone in the medical field. And then like, that's kind of how you decide who you're going to interview. And then you go from there, I guess. We had a handful of people who conducted an interview and then conducted a second interview so that they could have more to, uh, to choose from. Um, we have a couple questions coming in about uh, the subjects. And did you share at any point with your subjects? Um, and I actually think that some of the subjects are here tonight. Can somebody speak to that? Ty, I think your subject, is your subject here? I don't know. I think she was trying to make it, uh -huh. but um, I think she was running a little late to her computer, so. Yeah, Coco. Um, yeah, I got to it before I ran. Um, what I'll say, I also saw a question, I think it was from Tom Schaefer um, in the comments that asked about like depicting your person, which I thought was interesting. And so I'll get to that in a second. But my person is here, which is nerve wracking. Um, hi. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I hope I did well with that. 
I think I didn't share it before that point. Um, it was kind of just that like one interview and then we like emailed back and forth and she was like, do you need anything else? I was like, no, not really. But um, initially the video was supposed to be, I think, what was it? 10 minutes at the most. Ours, I forgot about the timing and ours ended up being, I want to say 18 minutes. And so there was a lot that I had to cut down and it was really hard because there was a lot of really good points. But in the end, even cut down to the point where I wanted it was four minutes long. So I had to really like go in and like cut things down for sure, which was hard for me to do. I'll admit, I definitely didn't want to part with some of the um, things she said, but I ended up choosing my parts. Um, and with depicting the character, I think I really just watched the video like over and over again. And I was lucky enough that I really know my interviewee and I really know like how she talks and stuff. And so I was kind of able to just mimic that. And yeah, by watching the video and watching her mannerisms and stuff. A lot of people, there was this constant watching the videos. Um, you know, I talked to students who said they probably watched their video over 20 times to really, you know, get that person inside to hear the speech patterns, to really be able to focus on the ums and the gestures and the tiniest of details. So they did, they, they really, this was a character study as well. Orion, you looked like you had something to say. Well, I know that my interviewees here tonight um, and it was interesting. I, interviewing Anne, I really wanted to interview her because I know she's a very flamboyant person and like very one of a kind. I, I really like the way she talks and she motions her hands and the way she tells stories. And so um, that's why I wanted to interview her. Um, I got so engrossed with like the process though. I, I never really shared any of my versions of the draft. So I think this was the first time uh, she saw it, which was mm. interesting. I don't know if other people have like shared more, but I know that um, I didn't share it until this point. I was so glad to see some of the uh, some of the subjects here, and we will make this tape and classroom tapes available for subjects as well. Uh, there's a question that I really like in here. I'm going to put to the whole uh, group. Um, someone asks, "Have you learned anything new about yourself in the process?" When you reflect on this process, what is, what's the takeaway? Yeah, Coco, go ahead. I feel like I'm speaking too much, but I actually had a relatively big um, takeaway. <laughs> I haven't done acting in a good couple years and I actually applied for um, an acting program because of this. It really just like brought me back into how much I really loved it. And so I think for a lot of people, it was really beneficial. Well, I see some a, a bright face and shining face that just came up. Um, hi, Ms. Fitzgibbon, would you like to say something? I'm just bursting with pride. I'm so happy to see um, you all from fifth and sixth period and just to know that you're sharing this wonderful, wonderful work with our Credo community. Um, just sending all good wishes your way and just a big thanks, Dr. Gordon, for um, picking up and carrying this forward. So, we love awesome. you. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to see your face. Um, the, the, the question, um, and yes, we're hearing a resounding, we love you, Ms. Fitzgibbon. Um, does anyone else want to pick that question up? Coco has changed paths, which is, um, that's pretty big. That's a big one. Um, what, what else have you guys taken away from this process? What, what have you learned? or been reminded of even, learn to focus on, strengthened. Josephine. Um, something I've learned during this process is like, especially during the interview stage, like really listening and trying to get behind what your interviewee is saying and like really see their point of view I feel like now, whenever any one of like my friends or people that I'm listening to are telling me stories, 
I really try and like step into their shoes and like see their emotions like that could have been happening when the story was taking place or like just that sort of stuff, which I find very interesting. Okay, you just made my night. <laughs> I love that. This work is about empathy. You know, it's about developing um, a, a deep understanding for someone else, really strengthening your ability to listen, but also to, to draw out, make someone comfortable and draw out their stories and then become them, step into their shoes. Um, so thank you. I'm, I'm, that wasn't a plant, I swear. Um, I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> uh, any last last responses to that? Yeah, Evelyn. Um, I don't have any responses to that question, but I think going back to the question, how did you choose like what part of the interview? Um, that was actually really hard for me because I interviewed my dad for like an hour. <laughs> and so I had to listen to it like for an hour. And there were so many good things in the interview that I wanted to include, but I just couldn't because it didn't make any sense. So I just went with, I think what, I think I went with like, what really like resonated with me and like what was the most interesting part because the story of the storm was like really interesting to me, so. There was some really inherent drama in that. Yeah, but so there, there, there's a process that I hear some of you talking about and we've, we've talked about in class that really is, it's, it's uncovering a story. You know, it's kind of like chipping the marble away to find that, uh, that piece that works. And people approach it different ways. Um, but getting to know the entire transcript. I had a student who, um, who her mother suggested that she use voice recognition technology to transcribe her interview, which may have made sense. And her response was, no, I'm gonna do it by hand because I wanna to get to know it better, um, which, you know, it's, it's exactly right. In transcribing, in rereading, in rewatching, you get to know those words so well that the story starts to uncover itself, starts to emerge. And then there is some craft in how these are uh, edited and sometimes a little bit of resequencing, but we don't add words to these monologues. Um, they truly are verbatim. Uh, any last comments that you guys wanna, wanna share? Yeah, Ty. Going back to what we learned, um, I actually put this in my letter of reflection um, because I, we heard so many stories about uh, like that, like of what's happening to people during the pandemic, what, even if it's sad or happy, I said like, and I still think this is true, you never know what's really going on behind the smile. Mm. I read that in your reflection, Ty. And there's, you know, we put faces on sometimes, which are necessary. And uh, I think a really, really good interviewer, which you guys were, you really, you know, you gave space for someone to tell their story. A really good interviewer allows someone to start to take that mask off a little bit and to show some vulnerability, um, to expose some. Um, so I, I, it's a wonderful uh, way to phrase that as well. Um, we have an attendee who'd like to speak. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is David Van Nuys, uh, Ella's grandfather. And I just have to, uh, first of all, congratulate you, Dr. Erickson. This is such a, a depthful exercise um, and just brought out universal truths. And, and I love the way that, that you prepped the students for this. I, I'm also, among other things, a professional interviewer myself. And so uh, I have to say, I'm really impressed by the job these students did. And I think this piece, what we've witnessed tonight should be on public TV. Yeah, um, yeah I, I don't know if anybody's got the pull to do that. But again, my congratulations to each one of you. I, I've was really moved by all of these presentations. Thank you, David. Um, and, and high praise coming from an interviewer. Uh, 
And I agree. Um, you know, with these projects, there's so many moving pieces. There's so many things to do. But I think that, uh, you know, we put together a little press release um, and, you know, being able to to find the right connections to send this out. I, I fully agree that, uh, you know, this deserves to be seen by many people and it would touch many people. It would really, you know, it, what, what you all have experienced as writers and performers, I think, is your power to move people, to really, to, to help them feel something and experience something, uh, which is pretty extraordinary, especially when it's your original work. You know, it's one thing to perform somebody else's words, very powerful, but to perform your original work, work that you created and know that you've moved an audience. Um, and it's a, that's, it's a gift to the audience and, and hopefully there's a real takeaway there for you guys as well. Any last questions? Last comments from the cast? So uh, this, this banner right here, this felt banner, um, I bought this at the beginning of the year um, because I knew that this was going to this was going to be a scary year. Um, it was going to challenge all of us in ways that we really couldn't expect. Um, and this message, "Be brave," uh, it just made sense to me. And I just recently put a Credo sticker on there because I think you know there's this reminder that you know this has been present in in my I guess if you call this rectangle right here a classroom in my classroom every day this year. And it's been a reminder going out, but you guys have also reminded me, you know, and I hope the audience that, that's here with us now to be brave, you know, to listen to these stories that yes, have tragedy in them, have some real challenges, but show resilience and show a strength and community and, and friendship and support, kindness, even kindness of strangers. Um, you guys embody that. Um, you have been brave and I really appreciate your work. Um, I've loved working with you. And I wanna give a big thank you to the audience for coming out and supporting. Um, so thank you guys. We will put the, uh, we'll, we'll put the recording up online so people can watch. I'm gonna put in the chat right now. Um, there's uh, my email address. If people wanna follow up with questions or you wanna work um, to get these stories out, I would, Love to see these guys spread to, uh, they are deserving of a wider audience. Follow up. Yeah, Orion. I wanted to really quickly say thank you so much to you and Miss Fitzgibbon. This is like an experience yeah, I that it. I never would have done unless I was like pushed to do it. And it's been amazing. It's something that's gonna sit with me for the rest of my life. Yes, so everyone I give a big thanks to our teachers in the, the yeah. comments. <laughs> thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's something that'll sit with me for the rest of my life, the skills that I've learned and the memories that I've made. And I just really wanted to give a big thank you to you guys. Thank well, you. that's a teacher's dream, right? What will endure. Um, and, and yes, that's another one that made my night. Thank you guys. Yeah, I have to come back on for that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being brave, everyone. Take care. Have a good night and congratulations.